So welcome everyone and thank you for joining us today for not one but uh, two talks. We have half an hour after this one so um, and the second one begins after that. I would like to thank uh, Lucas Bayer for taking the time to talk to us and I will just quickly introduce him um, and so we can start right away. So he studied at, at the EWTH Aachen University he was a PhD student uh, in high performance computing at the same university, and he did a PhD in computer vision. He's currently active in Zurich, working on representation learning and the transformer backbones at Google Brain. And before giving the stage to Lucas, I would just like to encourage people to think of questions during the talk and just write them in chat. And he has a few chapters or parts. And after each part, we're going to do a Q and A, small Q and A session. So if you ask the question, we're just gonna answer it in chronological order from the chat. So thank you and uh, let's begin. Yeah, uh, hello everyone. So yeah, today I, ah wait, just to double check, um, we uh, have time until 5.30, right? Yes, exactly. Okay, cool. Uh, so today I will basically teach you almost all that you ever wanted to know about transformers. Um, but only about the original vanilla transformer. There have been many variants proposed. I'm not going to cover all of these variants. However, I'm going to show you also how transformer is being used in many different contexts. And yeah, as Martin mentioned, I have several sections. And at the end of the section, I will have a pause and let you ask questions to make sure you understood everything from the previous one before we move to the next one, uh, unless we're running out of time. Um, all right. So without further ado, let's go. Uh, first, for the context, um, you probably all know that uh, in ML for a long time, the, the whole ML landscape looked like this. Like you have these different communities and they have their models and maybe even their like language and favorite ways to speak about ML or more specifically in deep learning. Uh, here are a few examples. This is not an exhaustive list, but a representative one. Uh, so, for example, in uh, we had computer vision, natural language processing, speech, translation, RL. These are all different sub-communities. And maybe at the beginning uh, of deep learning, before it completely exploded, it was still possible, if you're a researcher in one of those, to actually also read interesting papers from the other one every now and then, maybe be a bit inspired. But then, like, archives started exploding, and it's just not possible anymore. Even as a computer vision researcher, you cannot be on top of everything, even in just computer vision anymore. Uh, so over the last, let's say, decade-ish, these have become more and more siloed uh, with each community having like its things and looking less and less at what's going on in the other communities. And this is reflected also in the favorite architectures. Every community over time developed their neural network architecture that intuitively seems to fit perfectly the type of data they deal with. Uh, so. A few examples here in uh, computer vision, for example, if you want to do like detection, segmentation, whatever, let's say recognize the robot hand, uh, right? Then intuitively, it doesn't matter whether the robot hand is here in the bottom right part of the image or whether the robot hand is here in the top left part of the image. You always want to recognize a robot hand roughly the same way, right? Uh, at least intuitively, that makes sense. And so over time, architectures have developed with basically this intuition in mind. Uh, you all know probably convolutional neural nets and the modern variant is ResNet that use a convolution which has this property as their core operation. Uh, and then a few other kinds of layers and then with the network architecture on top of that. Um, similar story, which I think this one you are all very familiar with probably um, in natural language, language processing for a very long time, RNNs were the core architecture uh, which just makes sense for a language. Like most languages, you go in, in some direction, mostly from left to right, sometimes from right to left, but in you go through the input in a certain order, we as humans. So we model the architectures in the same way. Uh, RNNs, or most famously LSTMs, do this, right? They take in one piece of the input, like for example, one character, process it into their state, then take the next one, process it, merge it into their state, then take the next one, and so on. And it's like process and merge into state may be complicated, like in LSTMs, may be very simple, is alternate variants and so on. But it's the gist. They, again, like it intuitively makes a lot of sense given the type of data you see. 
Um, maybe jump head straight to translation, similar story uh, for the input, but then in the generation, instead of having like one output at the end, for example, uh, you would start generating again, like one piece uh, after another, uh, your output. Um, yeah, and in, in speech, there was yet another family. It took a bit longer, and there was yet another family of deep mod learning models which became popular uh, at first there, uh, which is based, which was deep belief nets uh, based on restricted bulk machine, which you train in auto encoder way layer by layer, and stack them all together and fine tune the whole thing. Uh, details don't really matter much. Uh, and in RL architecture wise, it was even more the wild west for a long time with like just everybody coming up with their own custom architecture, usually small ResNet or something like that, but no, no common ground at all. Um, so very fragmented community actually, and uh, not much looking at each other. However, in the last few years, this kind of happened. It's changed to this, uh, transformer everywhere. This picture represents or is from the original transformer paper and you'll see this picture a lot. It represents the transformer architecture. Uh, this is a little bit extreme. It's not that the other things I showed before don't exist anymore or that Transformer has completely replaced them, but in all of these communities, Transformer is now a prominent uh, architecture. Uh, and I think uh, some people hate it some because Transformer doesn't encode anything specific to that community. Uh, I think it's actually a nice, nice step because now we can suddenly start looking across communities again, right? For example, maybe in computer vision, we suddenly notice, oh, wow, when we scale up these transformers, they become unstable. And we can look at natural language processing. Oh, hey, they've been scaling up transformers for a while. Oh, look, there's like three different papers looking into instabilities, and we can borrow ideas, right? And th this way, I think the communities can learn a bit more from each other again. Um, anyways, so that's kind of what happened. Uh, and in the remaining part, uh, I will tell you first all about the transformer architecture. I will go into very uh, deep detail. And before that, even I'll go into very deep detail about the self-attention mechanism. So now, if you already implemented your own transformer uh, model at some point, for example, then this part may actually be boring for you and you may know the most uh, of it already. Typically, I do a show of hands. I cannot really do this well in Zoom. Um, but for those of you who never implemented this, uh, this will hopefully make it less mysterious. And we, after this, you will very clearly know what is Transformer, what does it mean, what's going on. Uh, and then in the second part, uh, I will mention how in each of these different communities the Transformer is adapted and used, uh, which may also give you more ideas on how to apply it to even other places. Right, and that's the rest of the talk. Um, so I start with uh, where I believe it all started, which is uh, quite a while ago, almost a decade actually, um, which is this paper, Neural Machine Translation by Joint E-Learning to Align and Translate uh, from Dmitry Badano and Kim Young Cho and Yoshua Benjo in 2014. Uh, this was, uh, to the best of my knowledge, the first paper introducing the attention mechanism almost exactly in the way that it's still used. Uh, the first figure here, in case you already know the attention mechanism and squint really hard, you may recognize it. Uh, but I think this plot doesn't really do it justice and this is actually not that easy to understand if you don't know it yet, I think. Um, then the, the paper itself was not really that much about architecture and attention mechanism, uh, but it was all about in translation, automatically learning to align things. Like uh, they had this example, um, when you want to translate from English uh, to French. Uh, in English, for example, I think this is a nice example. In English, uh, you don't have the, uh, how to say, words are not gendered, right? It's always the, the man, the woman, the blah, blah everything. In many other languages like French or German also, uh, nouns are actually gendered. And in French you have le, la, uh, or in some special circumstance it becomes this el apostrophe. In German you have der, die, das, right? Uh, so when you want to generate the this thing, I forgot what it's called, this der, die, das, or le, la, uh, you need to actually know what word is coming next and such that you know which one to use. Uh, and so here they propose this model 
that automatically learns to to do this. Uh, so, for example, here when they and this is uh, attention map. So we will see later what this exactly means. Um, but high level speaking, it means when you are looking at generating this character, you are actually looking here in the input sequence at both the but also the next word, man, such that you know, okay, man, and they need to translate it to om, which is gendered uh, male, and then I need to say le, but I know it's the om, so there is this special rule which makes it a level score. And this is all learned, and previously, such alignment things were mostly hard coded or following some heuristics. That was the big claim of this paper, and this was this alignment is learned via this attention mechanism. The whole paper only contains the word attention three times. And all three times in like just a couple of sentences, they don't really make a big fuss about it. Uh, and so, as far as I'm aware, it has not really picked up that much steam until three years later, uh, there was this paper that introduced the transformer architecture, which is built all around this attention mechanism and drops all other kind of uh, things like drops recurrence, drops, uh, well, okay, there was no CNN. No, actually there was a convolutions in translation back then, drops all of this and looks at how far can we go by building an architecture all about all around attention. Um, and so that's why it was called attention is all you need. Um, so I will start now by explaining the, the way that attention uh, actually works here and how you can think about the attention operation. Um, I like to explain attention as a kind of a soft dictionary look, look up. Like, like in Python, you have the Python dictionary and you can look things up in there, right? Um, but now we need to make everything soft and vector valued and so on, so that we can do back prop and actually do learning and learn the dictionary uh, and so on. Uh, so meaning here, as in a dictionary, we have a keys and we have values. For each key, we have a value. Because these keys are now vectors of floats and these values are vectors of floats, which may or may not be the same size. Uh, and we have a bunch of them. And then the typical operation you want to do in a dictionary is look up something. Uh, so we have a query, which is what thing do we want to look up, which itself is again a vector, uh, vector of floats. And now how does this lookup work? We take the query and compare it to each of the keys individually. And we get a similarity between query and key. Uh, for example, we can get this by dot product. Mm -hmm. If query and key are very similar vectors pointing in the same direction, then dot product will be a large positive number. If query and key are very dissimilar, it, dot product will be a large negative number, like pointing in opposite directions. Um, and so we can do this. Uh, we do this similarity to each of the keys. And so we get a list of uh, float values. Each value corresponds to one key and says how similar is that key to our query. Um, then what is done is these are normalized such that they sum up to one. And you could actually interpret them as uh, weights or as probabilities. And this is done with the softmax function. So very, let's take an example. Let's say one of the keys is very similar to our query vector and all others are very dissimilar. Then we would have uh, lots of large negative numbers, uh, one large positive number, and again, lots of large negative numbers. And we take the softmax, it turns it into lots of zeros uh, or almost zeros. Uh, a single almost one entry for the most similar key. And then again, lots of uh, almost zeros. OK, and these are called the attention weights. And now we use these to make a weighted sum of values. So for each value, we multiply it by its corresponding entry in the attention weights. And then continue plus next value times its attention weight, plus next value times its attention weight, and so on. And this becomes the output. Uh, and then in the example that I just gave, where all of these are almost zero except one, which is almost one, then this weighted sum means basically extract the one vector, like the one value that corresponds to the entry that is one, right? And so the output will, will be almost exactly the individual value. Um, this is written here in the formula, um, which yeah, in some sense, again, it's like the values, you put them together into a matrix and the attention weights is a vector. You just do the dot product and you have this. Um, let's take another example. When we have three keys, which are similar to the query and all others are dissimilar, 
Then here we have lots of large negative numbers and three large positive numbers. Taking softmax, we have lots of almost zeros and three uniform values. So one third, one third, and one third for each of these three keys. Uh, and then when we do the weighted sum, we actually average the three values, right? A third times one of the values plus a third times the other of the values plus a third times the other of the values plus lots of zeros or almost zeros. So then the output is the average of these three values whose keys were very similar to our query, right? So this is essentially the, the core, core part of the attention mechanism. And I hope now you see why I like to call it a soft dictionary lookup. Um, now, where do these things come from? Uh, we will see very clearly later when we actually put this mechanism into the full model. But in general, you have like some input set of vectors and you transform this uh, with a linear learnable mapping into both keys and values. So these vectors become your dictionary. Uh, and you have a, usually a different, sometimes the same other set of vectors or single vector from which you derive the query. And then you do your attention operation and get the output and do further processing with this output. Um, okay, wait, uh, is there a question here need for clarification? None yet. And then... There are no questions in the chat. If there are many, I'm gonna tell you. Then the next part. So I told you this is like the core core of attention mechanism, but I almost lied. Uh, this is not how it's actually used. There is a couple more things until we get to the one that is actually used. Uh, first of all, we usually don't have just a single query, but we have a whole bunch of queries. Uh, that is simple extension. Uh, we just stack them all together and we get many queries or matrix of queries. Then again, for, for each query, we get the attention vector, which we can stack together, and then we get the attention matrix. Uh, and then again, for each query, we get an output. We can stack them together, and we get the output matrix. Uh, that one is relatively simple. Uh, then there is another extension, which may be a little bit more difficult, but don't be scared. It's not that hard either. Uh, which is usually, uh, we don't use attention, but we, do, we use multi-head attention. And the multi-head attention basically means instead of doing one attention, we, we chop up our queries and do multiple attentions with them and then have multiple outputs. Uh, and it's usually shown with this picture, but I really don't like it. I don't think it's intuitive or I think it's a bit misleading. So what really happens uh, is this, I prefer this picture. With multi-head attention, we have our queries Right? Remember here, one column is a query, right? And the, the vertical is like uh, the feature size, like here the, it has six dimensions. Uh, so in multi head attention, we split it up into, for example, three uh, chunks of queries actually. And then with each of these chunks, we perform the attention operation or we get the attention matrix. Um, so we have three attention matrices. Uh, and thus, we also have three outputs. But again, like the, the values, like everything in the dictionary, we, we split into three across the dimensions if we have three heads, let's say. So we also have like three chunks of output. And those, we concat them uh, in this way to get back to our full dimensional output. Uh, this allows, this is uh, both more efficient and allows a bit more expressivity. And in practice, just always works better. So. Whenever someone tells you attention, they almost always mean multi-head attention, uh, but it's simpler to talk about it and think about it in terms of just the simple attention. Uh, and then taking all of these things together, it can actually be written quite concisely. Uh, so query times keys, and these are both matrices because we have many of them. I did forget to put the indices for the multi-head actually, they would be indices uh, per head. Um, then some normalizing factor, which is important in practice, uh, but doesn't matter in theory or for the understanding. Uh, is just consider it just a constant uh, to scale it. It's not learned, nothing, like just M of pi. 
Um, and then we take the softmax in order to get this attention matrix. Uh, and then we multiply by all of the values from the dictionary, this attention matrix to do this weighted summing of values and we get our outputs. Uh, so this is the full attention mechanism. Then a quick stop here to check for questions so far. If there is no questions, I assume you understood the attention mechanism. All right, then uh, you understood the attention mechanism. So let's see how it's actually used in a model. Uh, this is, yeah, so, so this I told you, right, is the representative picture of the transform architecture. And I'm gonna go through that one step by step in introducing all of the pieces. Um, so yeah, well, keep in mind that this was introduced for translation. So whenever we walk through the model, have the translation task in mind. For example, so the inputs would be uh, the original language, the text in the original language. Uh, like for example, in English, let's say the sentence, the detective investigated. And then on the output side, we want to generate the same sentence, but in a different language, right? Um, then the first thing, uh, yeah. I, I hope you're not all familiar with it already, uh, or it will be new to at least a few of you people. But the, the first question is that we have text as input, uh, but neural networks and the whole attention thing and everything that I explained before uh, is actually, was always about float vectors, right? And all of machine learning is actually, or deep learning is actually about float vectors. So we need to turn our text into float vectors before we pass it to the model. So we can actually do math with it and uh, start computing gradients and optimizing and so on. Um, so this is done in uh, the step that is called tokenization and embedding. Um, and this goes as follows. Uh, first, we have our input sentence and we do what is called we tokenize it, which is splitting it into pieces. Uh, most simple way would be splitting it into words, you just split every white space or something like that. Um, you can do that. Uh, there are more advanced ways that are typically used nowadays, uh, which is like called the tokenizers. And they split it into either words or sub pieces of words. Uh, I made up an arbitrary example here, of what it could look like. So the detective investigated, depending on your tokenizer, may be split into the tokens, the token detective, token invest, token egate and token add, for example. Uh, so this would be now five tokens. Then every tokenizer comes with a large list of the tokens that it knows about. Uh, so the detective and so on. Uh, and this is called its vocabulary. Uh, typical numbers are like vocabulary of 32,000 uh, tokens or even 250,000 tokens for example, for some multilingual tokenizers. Um, and so we have this huge list of known tokens to this tokenizer. Uh, and so each token is an entry in this list, in this vocabulary. So it has an index. And so we can represent the token by its index, actually. For example, the token the, maybe the third one in this tokenizer's vocabulary. So we can replace it by the integer three. The token detective, maybe the 721st one. Uh, in this tokenizer's vocabulary, so we can replace it by the number 721, uh, and so on and so forth. So by now, we have replaced the sentence by a vector or by a, a list of integers. Uh, we're almost there. The next thing is that now we can actually just have a random float vector or randomly initialized float vector for each entry in the vocabulary. Right? And then we can represent, instead of using the integer, we actually use the float vector uh, that we have in this vocabulary for that token. And that's called the token embedding. Um, and that's what we then eventually do. So now we have a list of float vectors, right? one float vector for each token. Uh, and this one is randomly initialized and will eventually be learned together with the model. So we succeeded. We now have a list of float vectors. And we turned our sentence into a list of float vectors, which we can pass to the model and use for further processing. Uh, we will soon use this 
uh, in the SERP attention or attention operation. Um, but there is one more caveat. Um, the attention mechanism, as I presented it, or as dictionary look, look up in general, doesn't care about ordering of the things, right? If you have a dictionary, no matter what order the keys in, uh, are stored in, if you query it with something, you always get the same output, right? Um, however, in uh, language, ordering of the words matters or ordering of the tokens, right? I, I can never come up with the example right on the spot, uh, but you can easily imagine a sentence and there is two words. If you flip their order, the meaning of the sentence changes, right? So I think it's easy to agree that ordering of words matters in uh, language. Uh, and so we need to encode this somehow, uh, such that the transformer can know about what order the words uh, are presented in. Um, and the, the way that was introduced in this transformer paper uh, is the following, is basically adding a position encoding. And I'm going to show you here uh, the intuitive way to understand what it does. Uh, in reality, it's a little bit more complex. But imagine uh, all of these vectors uh, that corresponds to the different uh, words in the, or tokens in the vocabulary uh, that you have, right? Let's imagine for, or assume for simplicity, they are all centered around zero in this abstract vector space. Um, and let's assume that they form like a point cloud that is not too large. Let's say radius smaller than one, okay? So you, the whole vocabulary is individual different points around zero that don't go too far from zero. Um, now what you can do is you say, okay, the first, the embedding of the first word, I always add 10. So you basically shift it uh, towards the position 10 in this abstract vector space, right? Uh, so no matter what word it is, it will be clearly near 10. Uh, and then where around 10 is it defines what is the word content or the token content. Right? And the second token, let's say you always add 20. So you move it in this other location in space around 20. The third word you add, uh, or third token, you add 30. So you move it into space to where is the 30, and it's always going to be near there. And this way, uh, you still have like your abstract vector space with, in the original dimensionality, uh, but the model now can know the ordering of the words, right? It always looks for the first word around this location 10 in this abstract space. Always looks for the second word in this location 20. Um, this is pretty much how positional encoding works. In reality, it's more complicated. It's not just a, a single scalar added, but it's like uh, whole vectors that are built from sine, cosines, whatnot. But that's the intuition behind it. Um, and so this is then the input that we will give to the model. The tokenized, embedded, and position encoding added vectors. So we give a set of vectors uh, that are built like this. Any questions so far? Or maybe you all knew this already, maybe not. Um, no questions yet. Okay. Um, then let's look at this uh, first left-hand side part, which is called the encoder, which takes the input, is the original sentence that we want to translate, right? Uh, first thing is that now these prepared vectors, these inputs, we send them through the multi-headed uh, self-attention mechanism. So in this case, here we had this, these tokens, right? But each of them are now a vector with the position encoding added. Um, and so each of the vectors, we transform it into queries, into, uh, into a query, into a key, and into a value. And then we perform self-attention. So we use each of the queries, uh, queries into the dictionary that is built via each of the keys and each of the values. Um, and then it gets the response uh, back and, and you get the output. So the way you can uh, get the intuition about what's going on here is that each token can basically look around at all other tokens that appear in the sentence, see what's there and compute the output based on what it sees or like update its representation based on what it sees. Um, right, so for example, I don't know, maybe this invest could be part of the word like investing as in finance, uh, or could be part of the word investigating like in detective, right? So it needs to look around what other things are there. Oh yeah, there is e gate and there's also detective. Yeah, yeah, so I'm very likely about performing an investigation and not an investment. And so update this knowledge. Um, as I 
the intuition you may get uh, that this may do. Then, after this uh, attention or self-attention that looks around, we have a block that is uh, sometimes called the feed-forward block, sometimes called the pointwise MLP block, um, sometimes called the one-by-one -one convolution, uh, and it looks like this. It's for each token individually. It is sent through a pretty large MLP. Um, in terms of equation, it just means multiply by your matrix at the bias, nonlinearity, multiply by your matrix at the bias. Uh, visually is represented here. So the dimension, the intermediate dimension is usually a lot larger, like something, oh, so for example, these, these vectors are usually something in the order between, let's say 128 and 768 or something like that, or maybe between 100 and 1000. Then this intermediate representation is usually like four or five up to an order of magnitude larger, something in the like 4,000 to 10,000 or something like that. Uh, and then going back to the original dimension. Um, first, the intuition, how you could imagine what this does is the previous step, you were able to look around what's going on, uh, like what other tokens are there. And here you can use a lot of compute power to try to process what you have seen before. So self-attention is kind of collecting information from the surroundings and the MRP is kind of processing this information um, and there is actually a few papers that try to really dig into it and deconstruct it, reverse engineer it, what is it doing? Uh, and one thing that I found interesting that one paper claimed that is happening here is that uh, some, like the knowledge about the world that you may see during the training is somehow encoded in these MRPs. So for example, the fact that uh, that Obama was president in 2008, or maybe that uh, Conan is a popular detective in uh, in anime uh, series, or things like that. They may all be encoded in these weights and be used while processing what you have seen here. Okay. I uh, also should mention that the largest amount of the parameters of the whole transformer architecture is typically in these MRPs. So there is a lot of power there. And for the people that try to scale up significantly transformers and make them much, much larger, they often focus on the MLP because it has regularly been shown to be the best uh, bang for your buck to scale this up. And so even the people looking at sparse transformers or a mixture of experts, usually like it all happens here in the MLP, the sparsity, the experts and so on. Not always, right? But in most cases. All right. Um, and like I said, some people like to call it one by one convolution because like convolution it applies to each locate. It does the same operation at each location uh, individually. Right now I did skip these uh, these parts at the end norm, but they are actually important. And I will try to also give you intuition about them. Uh, so first one is this add. This is residual connections. This comes from the computer vision community in the ResNet. The ResNet paper has introduced them. And let's first quickly look at the formula because it's simple, but I don't, I don't like it. It doesn't give good intuition. But essentially, if you have a module, module can be like the self-attention or the MLP, then adding a residual connection means add the input to the module back to its output. So it's really exactly this formula and the code would be exactly that. Uh, in the ResNet paper, the original one, this was shown for the first time to help training really deep models. Like before this was introduced, people were struggling, like in the deepest models in vision where 16 or 19 layer VGG model, where 16 layers they could still train, 19 they actually needed tons of hex. Uh, back then people in NLP community were jealous of vision people because vision people could train so deep models, like 16 layer deep. Um, and ResNet came in and was like, look, with, when we add this skip connection, we can now train 50, 100, 150 layer deep models without fancy tricks. So it was a, was a big breakthrough uh, back then. And this is added here too. However, I prefer to look at it or to get the intuition from a slightly different perspective. So here is the visualization. The left one is what you typically see shown in papers and tutorials and so on. The right one is the one I prefer. It's exactly the same thing, just things are slightly shifted. Um, so the left one really gives you this impression of the formula, right? You have the block and its input, you add it back to the output. Here, I prefer this one, which means you have your input 
and then you pass the input through the block and the block proposes an update that should be added to your input. And I think this gives a really nice intuition, which also goes together with now the self-attention, right? The self-attention looks around and the output of the attention is not your new representation, but it's a suggested update to your representation via this residual connection. Um, right, and same for the MLP block. So that's about the residual connection. And then there's the layer norm. Uh, that one is uh, to understand things is not too important, but to make things work, it, it is actually important. Um, so like there's many works and there's still, uh, still lots of debate why, but often it's useful to, and it's, it makes things easier to optimize and to train if you normalize internal representations uh, here and there. And that's what layer norm does. It basically takes the representation uh, removes mean, makes it unit uh, variance, and then adds some learnable scale and bias afterwards. Uh, maybe the thing to be aware of is that in transformers, there's like two, let's say, large families, the post-norm and the pre-norm. They differ in where they put the layer norm. Uh, in the picture, it would be either here uh, or here, like either in just the input to the block or in yeah, okay, I, I showed the bottom or the top is the same thing or like after the addition. Um, there is debate in which one is better. As you go deeper, you find evidence both ways. I would say it's still up to debate. Um, there is an important difference just to be aware of. All right, so this is all about the encoder. Uh, we do this, we stack it multiple times. We do this attention feed forward, attention, feed forward, attention, feed forward. Uh, transformers are often given names for different sizes like base and large. Uh, and typical things is for base, you stack this six times, for large, you stack this 12 times. Uh, there's other differences in base and large, like you make the dimension of the embeddings uh, wider and so on. Um, and then what comes out here is as many float vectors as you had tokens in the input also. But at this point, they are, think of them as like highly contextualized. Like there was a lot of processing of looking around what is in the sentence, what is in my knowledge of the world that I've learned during training and so on. So these are like high level, let's say understood in quotes, uh, versions of the input sentence that we were asked to translate. However, at this point, we have not done anything regarding the output yet, right? This is still the original sentence that we're supposed to translate. It's just that, okay, maybe we have understood it better now, but we haven't even started translating it. Um, this will happen then in the right-hand side, which is the decoder. But first, the chance for questions about the encoder in case there are any. So we have a question. What makes uh, Jilu uh, especially attractive in this case, as opposed to other activation functions, uh, for example, mm -hmm. leaky relu. Yeah, uh, in reality, nothing. Uh, like there are transformers which replace it by relu or switch or some other activation functions. There's even some work looking at all of them. The difference are relatively small actually uh, when you switch them out. It just happens that gelu works slightly better than the others in most typical benchmarks that people care about. And so people stick with that. Uh, but there is no, not that I know of any fundamental reason or but it typically doesn't make a huge difference either. Just there needs to be some nonlinearity for expressivity of the model. All right. Thanks. Then, yeah, then let's go to the decoder. Um, and yeah, it's also often called the generator. Um, how, how do we even pose this question of trans? Oh, I also forgot, I, I like to mention, um, this model was derived for translation from one language to another, but it's actually, we're lucky because the translation is a very general API. There's tons of tasks that you may care about that you can translate into a translation task. Uh, for example, if you want to summarize a video or summarize a movie, all right, you could think of the source language is the movie, like this video, and you want to translate it into one sentence. This is a very extreme example, but an example how you can, many different tasks that seem unrelated to, trans to translation, you can cast them into translation. 
Um, but now back to the translating language, how do you even formulate this? Uh, in principle, what we would want it is this. Z is the random variable that represents any possible text in the target language. And we would like, ideally, to compute the probability distribution over all possible uh, sentences in the target language, given the sentence we are asked to translate. If we had this, then the act of translation would mean taking the, the one with the highest probability, for example. Or if you want to be nice and suggest like five different translations that may make sense, like sampled or take the top five or randomly sample one out of the fives, right? If we had this probability distribution, it would be cool. We could do all kinds of nice things, including translation. Um, yeah, so here's the example uh, for our sentence, right? Uh, however, this just sounds crazy and it kind of is crazy. We cannot, it seems like we cannot do this, but there is a couple of nice tricks which allow us to essentially do this. Uh, or not to construct the whole P, but to sample from it. Um, and the first one is this uh, law from the probability theory that allows us to decompose. Uh, let's say now this Z, these all possible sentences, we actually represent them as a sequence of tokens. All right, so we have actually Z1, Z2, Z3, and so on until Z something. Uh, now we can decompose this probability into the probability of and we can pick any order, but in language it's just natural to pick language order, but order doesn't matter. We just need to pick one order. Um, so probability of Z1 given X times probability of Z2 given concrete value of Z1 and X times probability of Z3 given concrete value of Z2, Z1 and X and so on and so forth until the end. And this is the exact equality. So we have made no approximation here. However, now, if you think of uh, P being a model, uh, for example, for any machine learning model, actually, uh, the right-hand side here being the input of the model and the left-hand side being the output in terms of probabilities of tokens is just a softmax, like a multi-class classification, right? You probably, each token is a class uh, and you have as many classes as vocabulary in your tokenizer and you need the probability distribution over it. And that's it. Uh, and the model needs to be somewhat flexible though in that here, right? For the next time you want to use it, you want uh, two inputs, the representation of what you should translate, which you can already see this is what comes from the encoder, this X, right? And what you have chosen so far as token for the translation. And then it gives you probability distribution over the next token and so on. So this is something we can actually build. Um, and uh, let me jump ahead here. Yes, yeah, so I'm annotating them here, right? So in terms of architecture, here is X. It comes out of the encoder. Uh, input to the decoder is X on the side and what we have generated so far, let's say the first two tokens. And then output is probability distribution over the next token, given all of these inputs. Um, so we need a forward pass for each generating each token one after another. Um, and uh, when we have this probability distribution for the next token, we can choose what to do. And this is called like choosing how the decoding strategy. We could just pick the one with the highest probability and then move on to the next one. We could randomly sample one according to the probabilities, move on to the next one. We could keep the top five in mind and do something with them later and then move on to the next one based on all five possible futures. This would be uh, called beam search. There are many such strategies what you can do. Uh, there's this like a whole research field uh, decodings. Um, but yeah, this is the way we can actually make this problem tractable and modelable. Um, now, how do we go from these inputs to this output in the transformer uh, architecture wise? Well, first we start in essentially the same way, uh, self-attention of between the tokens we have generated so far. Um, however, there is a little trick um, because what I mentioned, this would be really excessively slow if every P, so for every token in our, in a single example, we need a forward pass, right? And for learning, this would be insanely slow like this is just for one example and then we want to have many examples in the mini batch and many mini batches over the training and so on 
Um, so luckily, there is two nice tricks we can use in transformers, one during training and one during generation to make this uh, more, more reasonable or more feasible. The first one is during training. Um, this self-attention, what we can do is when we have the attention matrix uh, between like all the tokens that have been generated so far between each other, we multiply this attention matrix by a masking by a mask matrix, which is a triangle of ones and a triangle of zeros. And this has the effect that each token can only look to its left, like to, to the ones that have been generated already and not to the ones that will still be generated. Because keep in mind during training, we can give, uh, if we do this during training, we can give all the tokens as uh, input side. And then the self-attention with this mask, it's called the causal mask, uh, only looks at what, if we were generating, what are the ones that would have already been generated before, like on the left. Uh, and this is a nice trick to make it efficient that we can compute all of these Ps in just a single pass. Uh, of the model for this is specific to the transform architecture to how it works. Um, if you didn't fully get it, it is not that important. Well, it's important once you want to implement auto regressive decoder, um, but then it's also a bit hard to explain. Um, then at generation time, we cannot do such trick anymore because we just cannot pass all the tokens because we don't know them. We haven't generated them yet, right? We really need to generate one at a time. Um, but then, uh, not going to cover the details, but it happens that many of the small computations done in the attention uh, are actually the same again and again at each step. Uh, and so we can do just a classic uh, computer science trick, uh, caching. We can have a cache that once we want to do an operation, it checks, oh, this operation, we already did it in a past step with exactly the same inputs. So we use the result instead of computing. It's very hairy to implement. Uh, and if you look at implementations of a decoders, autoregressively masked self-attention uh, block, it's quite complicated. There's a lot of book bookkeeping because of that, just to make it efficient. Um, but it's implementation detail. It doesn't matter for understanding or for what the model can do. Uh, all right, that was the hardest part. Um, then next, so th this was the self-attention is just such that the model understands what it has been generated so far, uh, right? In the output sequence. And now it mixes in what high level information from the, the conditioning signal it's called from the sentence we are asked to translate. Right? Uh, and this works again with attention. Uh, the, here, these characters we have generated so far, and especially there is a placeholder for the one we want to generate now, they become queries in the attention mechanism, and the encoders, high-level info vectors here, become keys and values in the attention mechanism. And this way, while decoding, the decoder can look at what is it actually supposed to generate the translation of, yeah, this attention mechanism and decide what to do, how to update its representations and so on. Uh, and this corresponds to these original papers, like the learned alignment uh, thing between input output. Um, yeah, and then uh, maybe one detail in terms of terminology. Uh, originally, attention is always like this. Like this. Uh, queries, keys, and values can come from different sources. But the case, the self-attention case, where all of these come from the same source that we've used in the encoder and here previously in the decoder, uh, so that would be called self-attention. But it's so widely used self-attention that very often people just call it attention for short and mean self-attention. And so people nowadays, when they mean this attention where the queries come from a different source than the keys and values, like to stress that this is what we mean, people now often call it cross attention even and not just attention anymore. Um, so when, just to make it clear when you come across these words. Um, all right, and then we have this MLP layer, nothing different, uh, same as before. And again, we stack these multiple times in the decoder and then we need the, to turn these representations of the tokens into probabilities. Uh, so just linear and softmax as in most other models. Um, Oh, why did it jump so fast? Uh, 
restart. This is a nice animation. It's going to restart. That shows this whole process of going through a transformer. Uh, first comes the encoder. We have all of these tokens. And they all attend to each other with the self-attention and generate the next uh, next level or next layer representation. So right? repeat, repeat, and then have a high level. Uh, then we go into the decoder. We have first a dummy token to get the probability of the first word. And then next word, you see first is the self-attention uh, using the already generated tokens. Then comes the cross-attention using the encoder's high-level info. And then we generate the next token. We sample one of them, or we take them highly, highest likely one, and so on. Uh, then when people talk about transformers, uh, they often have in mind a giant model, super slow, tons of compute, huge amount of data, uh, and so on. Uh, only one of them is actually true, huge amount of data. They work very well when you have huge amounts of data. And uh, they work much less well when you have little data because they are very flexible type of models. So you need a large model, a large amount of data to learn to use this flexibility in the right way. Uh, however, the original paper was actually quite impressive in that it reached state-of-the-art results with couple orders of magnitude, even up to three orders of magnitude less compute than the other non-transformative methods that were used before, which were convolutional, RNN-based, and so on. Uh, so in terms of compute, it's actually efficient, uh, the transformer. All right. Uh, so this is about the transformer architecture. I'm going to a quick break in case there's questions to the architecture. So yes, so let me start with um, Doug's question. So he asks uh, how the number of uh, head in multi-head uh, attention is decided, or I can reframe the question mm -hmm. uh, to also ask if there is some kind of intuition behind um, how many attention heads to use, or is it purely a random hyperparameter optimization? Yeah, uh, mostly that. Should be more than one, then it works much better. Then use whatever works best, plus whatever works well for your hardware. GPUs and the TPUs, even worse, have some magic numbers that they like. Uh, and uh, depending on how, how large are your float vectors and how many heads you choose, um, operations run with different sizes. And some sizes will be much slower than others. Uh, so it's a mix of what works best plus what is efficient on your hardware that you're running in. Thank you. Uh, Neil asks, what about the first iteration where no token has been predicted yet? Do we take the first one to be default? For example, yeah. SEP, like separation. I think this was about the position of encodings, yeah. Yeah, this is uh, shown here also. Yeah, yeah, the first one is a dummy one. Uh, so you actually, in the code base of the decoder, you often like shift the targets by one and then fed with the dummy like this start one here. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, so Maxime asks, it feels like query key value weight matrices have a more specific role or context than other weights in the arch, in the architecture. Is there any reason to provide them with different initialization scheme from other weights in the network? Mm, they don't necessarily have more important role. Like I mentioned, the ones in the MLP somehow encode word knowledge, which is also pretty important, right? So I wouldn't say either of them are more important or more special than others. Uh, and usually they are all initialized with the same initialization heuristic, which is just based on their shapes. Okay. Um, we have no more questions in the chat, but I would like to abuse the stage and ask, actually ask you, ask you something. Uh -huh. um, so I saw that you're working on deep learning for computer vision on mobile robots, focus mm -hmm. on low annotation efforts. And you already mentioned scaling. So we'd just like, like to ask you, like for your personal opinion on improving rather than scaling into infinity. And also with the, in, with the context of annotation and the role of human yeah. annotation. And yeah. all, and maybe even data quality because we you even mentioned data like two minutes ago. Yeah, yeah. Um, this I can give a whole other talk or talk about this, <laughs> but uh, my TLDR is I think the best uh, way forward that we know of. I, I personally don't like playing augmentation and regularization games, which you usually have to do when you have a little data. 
you need to come up with some kinds of augmentation that may make sense for your data. Uh, that's a lot of like human prior that you put in again. And I think often human prior is maybe a little bit correct, but not completely correct. And will eventually be a dead end, but may help in the short term. Uh, so what I really like lately is pre-training and then uh, transferring or fine tuning. And pre-training should be something where you have a lot of data that is not hard to get. Uh, that may not be perfect and not be super clean, but there is a lot and it's not that hard to get. For example, a very recent, very popular way is uh, for computer vision, image and text from the web, right? You, you can get tons of it. It is not perfectly clean, but it has definitely useful signal. Then pre-train uh, on that to learn like a general representation of whatever the data is. And then we have found uh, time and time, every time again, when you do this, get a general model, then you can fine tune it to a specialized task that you want to solve. And for that specialized task, you don't need that much data anymore. Uh, you, because it just, it, the model already has a general knowledge of the world that you care about. Um, yeah, and so this, I, I very much like this setting of large scale, large data pre-training, but with data that is very easy to get or very cheap to get. And then having expensive, but very detailed, but small data for the exact task you want to do. All right, I Thank see you. that we have 15 minutes. Um, so I will breeze through the last part which is about how the transformer took over all of these different communities. Um, so the first one was uh, language modeling NLP, which I think most of you are most familiar with. There is three different ways in which the transformer uh, kind of made a big impact there. Um, and these are all three different ways of using the transformer. The first one is GPT, which is a decoder only model. So this is exactly the transformer before, but only the right hand side, the decoder. You may notice it's a bit smaller. One part is missing, this cross attention. Since there is no encoder, there is nothing to attend to. Um, so this is then a purely learning a decoder to model the probability distribution over all language, not conditioned on something you want to translate, just probability of all texts, and that's it. Uh, and just train it as a decoder, uh, as a pre-training task. This is an example of what I just mentioned, right? You can just use all texts you can find, for example, on the web, and train this as pre-training and then use it, maybe fine tuning, maybe other ways for the tasks you care about. Another one is the opposite of this, taking only the encoder. Uh, that is, BERT is the most prominent example. Um, so this is called mask language modeling, where then you take your tokens, but some of them, maybe 10 or 15% of them, you randomly replace them by a dummy mask token. And the task at the output of the encoder is to predict, give a probability distribution over which token might have been there. And this way, again, you need to learn a lot of things about the world in order to be able to give a good answer here. And then finally, there is this uh, T5 is a good example of this, where you use the full transformer and you basically cast lots of tasks as translation. For example, in language, you may cast three different tasks in trans as translation this way, like literally translation. The input would be translate from English to German. This is good. And the output from the decoder, you would want to have this is good. And summarization as input, you pass summarize and then a long, long, long text. And as output, you want and then a single sentence summary of the text. Or classification, you could say, uh, as input, you pass, is this toxic? You look beautiful today. And as output, you may want the decoder to create this is not toxic or something like that. Uh, and this way, uh, you could also pre-train the full transformer. Uh, then computer vision. Um, for actually, for quite a while, people have looked at, can we use attention in the transformer for computer vision with, usually the idea was uh, ideally the pixels become the token. And then we have every pixel attending to every pixel that must be super powerful. We can learn a lot from this. But yeah, it's powerful, but it's also excessive. Typical sizes in computer vision are two to four pixels squared. Uh, that would be a sequence length of around 50,000. Uh, and attention, remember, it's all to all. So it's a quadratic in terms of that, again, the complexity, which is completely infeasible in terms of both compute and memory. It just doesn't work. 
Uh, and so there were quite a series of papers then taking inspiration from classic computer vision architecture, convolutional nets, and trying to apply self-attention or attention only in a local neighborhood. And then maybe somehow have this model slide over the image that always does attention only in local neighborhood. These models somewhat worked, but they were also not really big breakthroughs or not actually almost just small modifications of convolution nets, right? No spiritual uh, big difference. Uh, then this paper actually made a big, big shift in the landscape uh, by saying, no, let's not look at every pixel, but let's look at small patches. For example, cut the image into patches that are 16 by 16 pixels. And then each patch, we just flatten it, project it into abstract space, and now it's tokens. And pass each of these into the regular transformer encoder, and then have, for example, take an output uh, and pre-train it with classification, for example, because in vision there is lots of large uh, classification data sets available. Uh, and this was a key difference that uh, changed everything and make this actually work, because now you have the, a reasonable amount of tokens, similar to the amount you have in language, uh, and you still pass the whole image, not just a little slice of it, to the transformer encoder. Um, so that is an important lesson to keep in mind. And if I'm going to skip this side note, and if we now look at the next community, uh, speech, similar story, actually. You take the signal. This is a standard speech preprocessing, transforming the wave into this uh, spectrogram thingy. Um, then cut this spectrogram into pieces uh, instead of passing the whole one. And then each piece becomes a token, and we pass this through the transformer. Uh, first big. Uh, paper doing this uh, was the conformer, or doing this with really good results was conformer, which is exactly original transformer, uh, small modifications sprinkled here and there, but they don't matter much. Uh, now I need to update this slide, actually. There was recently from uh, OpenAI, the paper what was it called Whisper, which is exactly the original transformer, but do this, like cut the spectrogram into pieces and pass it through the original transformer, encoder decoder. And the output could, for, for example, be a text uh, version of the audio that you had as input. Um, then this one I like a lot, uh, reinforcement learning. There is one branch of it, which is called offline reinforcement learning, which is you have a large collection of traces from your environment, for example, from your game that you're playing. And now you just learn to model these traces uh, or to imitate these traces. Assumption is that these traces are from relatively good players or people relatively good at performing the task, and you want to learn to imitate them, basically. Um, and so this, the, recently, the transformer has also taken over there uh, via this paper, Decision Transformer, which has become quite important. What do you do? Well, these traces, uh, same story. They usually start with the observation, what you see currently. If it's an image, we do the vision thing, cut it into pieces. Each piece, piece becomes a token. Uh, then this is the nice trick. Uh, when you have the trace, you know the return. So at any moment in time, you know, because it's an offline thing, you collected the trace beforehand, you know the sum of all rewards that are still outstanding, that this trace will collect in the future. Uh, so just pass this as the next token, and you will soon see why. Then pass the action that the person uh, collecting the trace took uh, as the next token. Then the reward that the environment gave us, usually often zero, sometimes plus, sometimes minus. Uh, and so on, and see this as a sequence, and or as a language, if you will, and do language modeling, like a transformer decoder uh, on that. Then once you have that, you can generate new sequences like this, right? So let's say you, at this time, you want to play the game. So you have an observation, you cut it into pieces, pass it to the transformer, and now it gives you probability distribution uh, each time over the next thing, right? Here you don't care probability distribution over the next uh, patch because you're not into generating images. Um, but at this point, this one, you don't know the future once you deploy it. But you can just come up with it. You say like, okay, I put a high number here, like 9999, uh, very high score. And then the transformer gets this and think, oh, wow, this is an expert playing. So what action did the really good expert actually take? And it proposes this, right? Um, this is a nice way to, to kind of use extra information that you have during training time, but may not have as test time, but could be nice to set at test time, to, to like put your wish there at test time, right? Um, 
Of course, this doesn't work in uh, completely arbitrary uh, ways, right? So there must be also in the replay buffer expert traces that get such a high return. Uh, but if they are, then the transformer decoder will actually sample the actions that are more played by these expert players than not. I think this is a co pretty cool paradigm. And if you have seen this um, from language modeling, this let's think step by step is basically a variant of this, but for language. Um, and beyond that, there is actually a unification of communities happening. You've probably noticed recently lots of papers of image and text already. Which basically, with this idea, any input that you have, just cut it into pieces, transform it into tokens somehow, and then you can pass it into a transformer. Uh, even more, like image, text, and audio, there have been multiple papers doing this, uh, right? And this way you can learn a multimodal model, which really understands these different modalities and can reason across them, which is pretty cool, I think. This is a very recent thing. Uh, and uh, I want to end with one important note on e e efficient transformers. From some colleague of mine, there was this nice survey paper, paper efficient transformers are survey. Um, as I mentioned in passing, the attention becomes really excessively slow and memory hungry when you have a very long sequence length. So not naturally, as we researchers are, oh, uh, disadvantage somewhere, let's dig into this and propose solutions. So there have been a lot of alternatives to uh, transformers into attention proposed in the recent past. And this survey kind of tries to classify them in what approaches they take um, and so on. And then the, these largely same authors as the survey then propose the benchmark uh, to actually measure how good is a model at modeling long sequences or at dealing with long sequences. And then they benchmarked a lot of these proposed transformers. And the result is somewhat disappointing. Uh, this is the key plot. X-axis is the speed of the model. How fast is it? Y-axis is this long-range arena that the benchmark they created, long-range arena score. Higher means the model is better at dealing with these long sequences. And what you can see here is basically the original transformer is still modulo big bird, uh, is still the best at modeling the long sequences. And any proposed improvement in terms of speed pace in terms of performance. So there is a, there is no silver bullet yet. There is a, a trade-off. If you want a faster model, you pay in terms of performance. Um, and with that, I want to stop here, uh, give you time for questions, and thanks for your attention. Thank you so much. Um, this was very interesting and also very approachable. So it was presented in a really um understandable way but also not basic so i think it's a nice balance and we have already a question uh, by neil and he's asking what's the benefit of decoder only architecture if encoder only can predict masks in different positions as well uh yeah that's a very good question almost <laughs> philosophical uh, there is different schools like the one is the decoder has this nice and really strict and correct probabilistic interpretation that, that I mentioned, right, with this P, how you decompose it. So you, the decoder really models the, or if optimization works perfectly, the decoder will really model the whole probability distribution over this. And then you can do funny things with that. The encoder only, a priori, it doesn't. I actually didn't fully follow, but there were some papers claiming like, oh, you can reuse this encoder only to approximate the actual distribution. Uh, I didn't fully follow like how far this goes, but that would be one uh, major difference that I see. And encoder only is much simpler to implement though. If you want to implement something, I would definitely start with encoder only model. And for example, a vision transformer is the encoder only. Thank you. Um, I will also take this time to ask another question. Uh, what are limitations of transformers are you aware of besides tasks not being able to split up into tokens? Mm -hmm. um, I'm actually not aware of tasks not able to split up into tokens. It may not always be obvious how to ideally split it up into tokens, right? In computer vision, which is what I'm expert in, 
in hindsight, it's surprising, but it took a long time to find this way that patches is the best way to split it into tokens. Um, so there may be other areas that I'm not aware of where it's not yet clear what is the best way. Um, limitation of transformer, I would say it's at the same time, its biggest advantage is also its biggest limitation. It's a very flexible model. So you need some way to handle this flexibility. The best way, or in my opinion, is to have lots of data in the pre-training at least. Um, but at the same time, this is a disadvantage. If you don't have a good way to pre-train and have little data, then typically transformer performs really poorly. And you're better off with a model that follows the idea of your data, like a CNN in vision or RNN LSTM in language. Well, and then I think the it's hard to say this is really a disadvantage, but I am really annoyed by the decoder, these implementation complexities to make it efficient. I like simple implementations more, and I think transformer decoder is relatively complex once you go to the implementation. Thank you. Um, so I'm going to have maybe one more question, and then we can close it off. Uh, what do you think is a good research area to work with transformers where you have low resources? Low resources in terms of compute or data may not be the same thing. Um, and that's a good question, actually. It depends what you mean by work with or on transformers. I think actually when you don't have the resources, be it data or um, compute to train one such that they work well, then I think it's actually a really interesting direction to analyze existing ones. Uh, for some reason, uh, over the last few years, lots of uh, big companies with big budgets to train large ones actually release them. Uh, and so there are quite a few of them that are well-trained uh, that you can just download. And I think analyzing them and seeing what's going on is actually a very interesting thing where you need a lot of creativity uh, and uh, potentially not much compute and not much data. Like the example that I mentioned in the explanation, the paper I really liked it, that tried to reverse engineer what's going on and figured out that the MLP stores world knowledge. Right? You, know, you may not even need to train anything to do this kind of thing. So, so I would like to see lots of papers like this, actually. Thank you. Um, just as a mention to people in the meeting, uh, these slides that were really helpful uh, can be found in the, uh, in the link from the Discord event. And so you can look it up uh, afterwards. This recording is going to go up on our YouTube channel in a few days so you can rewatch it if you want and so i would just like to remind people that in 30 minutes we have our next event so you can join in after that and maybe um because lucas um talked about how he can give a whole talk about data and um, uh, scaling maybe we can see each other in a few months again uh that would be great but um uh, in any case thank you so much for taking the time and uh, this was really interesting and interactive and I, yeah thank you very much All right. thanks for having me and have a nice evening Bye -bye. thank you